now, now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our, uh, our co-coordinator um, and one of our fearless leaders here, Ms. Kelly Martins. Uh, Kelly's going to actually share with us uh, our guest speaker for today and, uh, and just get that introduced and facilitate uh, the Q&A session that follows that. So Kelly, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. Very good. Um, so yeah, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. I've been actually working really hard to get um, quality guest speakers lined up for all three of our calls and then our all-day meeting. Um, I know the great thing is we already have an amazing team. A lot of us will be giving messages as well. A lot of our guests like Curtis and Luke and Seth and Jonathan will all be speaking um, on our calls and at our all-day meeting as well, doing some role-playing. Um, but I really wanted to make sure that we also brought in um, really the best of the best from outside of our Texoma team as well, outside of our state fair team. Um, not just, you know, yeah, we can get this random person to speak on our call for 20 minutes, but who are going to be like actual needle movers? Who are the people that are really going to launch us forward? Who are the people that are doing the best of the best? Who are the people that are getting um, the highest results, um, who are selling more than everyone else, who um, really are setting an example that we want to follow? So uh, yeah, Josh is correct. Um, I, there were several people that like, I was like, I want this person on our call and I'm going to chase them down and make it happen. Um, so I'm super excited about the lineup that we have on some of our uh, upcoming calls. Um, today though was the one I was most excited about, which we have Mr. Brandon Brown here to speak to us. So just a couple of quick stats. I know he really needs no introduction, uh, but just so you know, we all know Brandon's very successful, but just so you know how successful. Um, he did start in uh, 2007. He's at $3.3 million in career sales. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of that was sold last year. Uh, no, but last year he did sell $770,000, which is just like mind blowing. Um, pretty much double, I think, what most of us sell. Uh, and he has the same amount of time that we do, which is pretty incredible. So uh, this year he's already at 440 and he hasn't even started the LA County Fair yet. If you don't know, Brandon works at the LA County Fair, which is the event, the one event every single year that beats the State Fair of Texas. Um, we'll see if that's the case this year. But we wanted to basically um, get kind of the, uh, the inside scoop from the most successful team in the nation at how to execute a massive fair. And they do it in less time than we have. So we really want to make sure that we are maximizing our event, that we're understanding what other teams are doing, right? We, we steal from the best with pride. We've always said that we're going to give credit to the people who are doing the best. We want to learn from them and we want to learn how to uh, have those same results ourselves. So he does work uh, for that. He also um, had a hundred thousand dollar push period, which is just, I can't even quite wrap my mind around, which is incredible. Um, Chelsea and I both worked for uh, for SC2 like nonstop, right? For two and a half weeks, I was only able to crank out 40. She cranked out 60. I cannot imagine <laughs> what it would look like uh, to grow another 40 to 60k as, after that. So um, I'm really excited to hear the the goods that Brandon's going to share. Um, and then just my own personal. Um, Experience. I went out to cross train with Brandon earlier this year in April. Um, just watched him at uh, just a um, an outdoor festival, the Lemon Festival they do there. The interesting thing is, you know, people are people everywhere. There was nothing crazy. It's not like wow, these California people. They're just buying ultimate sets left and right. You know, they just have so much more money. Um, that was not the case. In fact, I saw people be. Uh, more mean and horrified by the price of Cutco than I think I have at any other show. Um, and Brandon handles it with such grace and confidence and just brushes it off. It's no big deal. Uh, but something that's really cool about Brandon is just he positions things so well with customers. Um, people don't even, most of the time, people really don't even question the price. Uh, people are like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, he sells everything at full price. Um, it just shows people why Cutco is such a good value, even at full price. You're not buying Cutco because you want to get a really good discount. You're not kind of cut, buying Cutco because it's 60% off today at the fair. Um, you're buying Cutco because you need Cutco and because it's the best. Um, I've never seen anybody that interacts so well with customers with such few words. Um, a lot of us can have a habit of trying to talk customers to death, like this one next to me. Uh, just talk and talk and talk at customers until they buy. Um, you know, Brandon is very careful with the words that he chooses to customers. Everything he says is very intentional. It's very deliberate. Um, and it makes people really understand and get the maximum value uh, without wasting any time, without kind of overwhelming or confusing them, which I think is really cool. Um, and even when people want to walk away from Brandon, they're like, yeah, I'll think about it. Um, he keeps them there in such a calm and you know present way it's not like it's stressful or it's awkward or people are trying to leave and he's forcing them to stay and making it weird or uncomfortable um people stick around because they want to hear what he has to say 
uh, people say they're going to think about it and then they decide to stay because they want to hear what Brandon has to say. So um, he really builds a fantastic rapport with customers and makes them want to listen and want to buy from him. So today he's going to be talking to us really about the whys um, of like of the demo what he does, what he says, um, when it's important to say it, why it's important to say it, and really just kind of the, um, you know, the underlying reasons for what, why we do what we do. Instead of just, here's the script, please uh, memorize it and regurgitate it. Um, it's why do we say each thing, why is it impactful, and uh, how does it affect the customer? So uh, without further ado, we'll turn it over to Brandon. Wow, thank you. That was one of the most authentic, genuine introductions I think I've ever received. So thank you, Kelly, for that. Um, <clears throat> well, I got to say, um, I think this is the second or third year I've had the privilege to speak to you guys um, before your fair. And I absolutely love the opportunity to do so because I had Kelly uh, text me who is going to be participating at the fair this year and it's just a completely stacked lineup um so it's really awesome to be able to see you guys all like come together and cultivate some awesome sales every single year especially this year i know you guys are going for some huge numbers and i just love the um opportunity that i have to be able to influence all of you guys at a really high level and be able to share some goods with you that I hold near and dear to my heart on how I run my business and something that you guys can all, um, I think, implement in a very simplistic way and see dramatic results from it. Um, so what I'm going to teach you isn't anything like rocket science, isn't, isn't a secret playbook. It's something that just a lot of people don't take the time to really fully understand. Um, and so this is a message that I crafted for people that I mentor. Um, and I was asked to give a message, message to Jason's team, so I shared it with them and got a lot of positive feedback, um, I guess enough to have it kind of ripple through different states, and so that's why I'm here today giving you the same message, and I think there may be one or two people who have heard it, but it's like really good stuff, I believe, and something that is definitely worth hearing it again, or if you ask Michael the Master, hey, I've listened to that recording like seven times since you gave him, gave him the message. So that's always uh, positive. Um, so the, the title of the message is going to be the, the whys of everything. And really where this came from was uh, taking time to understand, you know, why you do what you do. Um, it's very easy to go through the motions. It's really easy, as Kelly said, to just have a script and memorize and regurgitate, regurgitate it. But what's funny about that is, you know, when you're working with a customer, that's not always the situation. Like there's always like small nuances that take place throughout an entire conversation with a customer where you have to be in tune enough to understand where the customer's coming from, be in tune enough with where you are in your pitch and in your process and be able to pivot and shift and be flexible to really make sure that you're serving the customer at the highest level. And it's really a craft. It's something that you have to master that um, I don't believe I've really reached the full potential of what's actually possible with that, but something that is really important to me and something I'm always constantly working on. So I wanna share that with you guys. So why it's important to understand the why is uh, five things more intention you'll have more intention with every single word that you say there'll be more purpose behind it is number two purpose you'll also have a lot more clarity on your outcome like when you say something or when you ask a question what's the outcome that you're looking for do you have an outcome or are you just saying it just to say it because you learned it at a net meeting, right? Completely different, right? And then there's also the fourth pillar, which is just as important, which is conviction. When you're asking a question or saying, making a statement, there's gonna be more conviction in what you're actually saying when you truly understand the intention, the purpose, right? The outcome, what you're actually looking for from the customer when you make that statement. And fifth and final is belief, right? So intention, purpose, outcome, conviction, and belief. That is why it's so important that when you're 
you, it's why it's so important for you to understand the whys behind everything that you say. So, you know, Kelly mentioned that, like, I don't use a lot of words. I'm very simplistic in my approach. And that's because I have a lot of clarity around what I'm looking to extract from the customer. When I'm asking a question, I'm very clear on what I'm looking for and I'm paying attention to those things. And so that's what allows me to do that. So, you know, if I were to ask you guys the question, like how many times have you wanted someone's script, but never actually took the time to understand why he or she was saying what they were saying in the script? You know, we talk about, oh, I have Josh's script. I got Jason's script. I got Curtis's script. All great, powerful scripts, but not nearly as powerful as if, as the people who wrote it, because they probably have a lot more clarity behind why they're actually saying that. And so I am like not a believer of scripts. Like I have people ask me all the time, hey, do you have a script? Do you have a script? No, I don't use scripts because it's ever changing. And I never, every time you write a script, as soon as you use it, it's basically old, right? And so instead of writing a script that some people are using that are four, five, six years old, it's like always let it evolve, always let it change because customers are always changing, interactions are always changing, people are always up leveling and I wanna be as flexible as possible during those scenarios. So um, best analogy, if, if it's not clear enough yet, is it's like when you were in grade school and you know you basically looked in the back of a math book right and it had all the odd answers and you were able to like get the answers out of your math book right and it was so easy to like oh cool i got the answer right but you have no clue how it came up to the answer right so in my opinion having scripts is like the back of a math book right understanding the whys of it is like having a tutor sit down with you and explain to you why the math problem goes the way that it goes, right? That's the difference. So I'm gonna attempt to, to do that for you guys here. So I have a series of questions that I ask my customers throughout a pitch, several of which I'm pretty sure you guys ask. But what I'm gonna do is take the time to really explain to you what, you're, what you should be looking for when you ask those questions or when you make those statements. So the first ones will start really simple, right? It's the simple question of, are you familiar with Cutco? Right? That's probably a question that a lot of you ask. Um, some of you may ask the question, have you heard of Cutco? And some of you know this, cause this is a little bit more simple, right? But the reason why you don't say, are, have you heard of Cutco? is because it literally implies that Cutco is not that popular and that it's something that you're not familiar with. So it's like, hey, have you heard of this? Versus are you familiar with it using that language pattern? That implies that, hey, this is something you should already know about. A lot of people already know about it. It's very popular. So are you familiar with Cutco, right? Very simple switch. Maybe you even ask the question, are you familiar with Cutco? But you don't really know why, you just say it because maybe someone else says it, right? And if you are saying, have you heard of Cutco? Simple shift to, are you familiar with Cutco? Is going to leave a longer lasting impression with your customer, okay? Number two, simple question, which pieces do you own, right? We all ask that question. But let's, get, let's go a little deeper so that we can really understand the purpose behind it. So. Which pieces do you own, all right? I, and when do you ask that question? Well, we all know the customers who walk by and you ask, hey, are you familiar with Cutco? And they say, oh yeah, we got some, and they keep walking. And you try to do anything and everything you can to like get them to stop. One of the most simple and powerful questions you can ask is, hey, which pieces do you own? And you point to the knife farthest away from the opposite direction they're walking. Right, so it's like the paring knife, right, in the homemaker, or I have the four inch paring knife on the very opposite end, or maybe you have a third display board with all the Santoku pieces. You point to the other direction. It's like, hey, do you have this knife, or which pieces do you own? And you're pointing in that direction, which forces them to walk over. And the reason why that's such a great question to ask is because a lot of people are very prideful of the fact that A, they own Cutco and they wanna show you how many pieces they own, whether it's five or 50. 
right? So it brings them back to the booth. So that's a great time to ask that question. It also, why else would you ask it? Well, you get to see what their favorites are, if they have a set or if they have pieces. And it helps you get a lot of clarity on what the best package would be for them. You know, what's interesting is when you ask that question, which pieces do you own? A lot of times they're going to divulge a lot of information that's really valuable for you as a sales rep to collect so you kind of know what direction to go. You're going to probably learn stuff like if they bought it all at once or if they bought it over time, right? Why is that important? Well, that's really important because if they bought it all at once, they're used to making larger purchases with Cutco. If they bought it over time, that means they're used to buying one, two, three, four, five pieces at a time. So it's your responsibility to basically reconstruct and retrain them how they should actually be buying Cutco, which is in bulk, right? A lot of people wouldn't think to extract that type of information from a simple question like, which pieces do you own? But when you ask that, they're gonna tell you a lot of that stuff. They're gonna say, oh, this is my favorite. Cool, mental note, I can show them something in an ultimate set that's very similar to that, that I can tell them why that would be their new favorite piece, which is gonna make them want to be more excited about getting an ultimate upgrade, right? So the simple question, a lot of information to be received from how they respond to that, right? Another question, super simple. How long have you owned Cutco? Some of you ask that probably for no reason at all besides it's a filler. You have no purpose besides, I'm just curious how long you've had it. Have you ever taken the time to really ask the reasoning behind why you would ask that in the first place? The number one reason is because I want to know how familiar they are with the price of Cutco right? How long have you owned it? Right? And there's another obviously follow up question to that. But I want to know how familiar they are with the price of Cutco, how long ago they purchased it. Right? And then another reason is I like to use the length of time and how and how much they love their current collection as leverage for why they should upgrade if they're on the fence. So I like to know, oh, you've had it for 15 years, 20 years. I'm gonna use that data and put it kind of on a side pocket. So at the end, if they're on the fence of whether or not they should upgrade to an ultimate set, I can remind them, hey, remind me again, even if I already know the answer, how long have you had Cutco? 20 years. Isn't that one of the best investments you've ever made? Have you ever once regretted your purchase, right? And you probably don't even remember how much you spent on it, but that you use it every single day, right? All things that I can use as leverage to put them over the fence when they're right there. Or how long have you owned Cutco? That same question and the answer can be used when you're trying to get them bought into the idea of hope chests, into buying sets for their kids. Oh, you've had your set for 40 years? Or what's better is if they answer it and say less than 10 years. Because then I'll use a follow-up question and I'll say, hey, Josh, that's awesome that you've had them for 10 years. You probably had no clue Cutco is as great as you realize now from when you first bought it. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Imagine how awesome it would be if you had Cutco when you first got married. Oh, that would be incredible. I wish I knew about you guys 20, 30 years ago. Great, right? You know, and then you can, I'm not going to go into too far, like too deep into to this conversation, but basically you can utilize those questions when you were bringing in hope chest because they wish they had it when they got married. Well, imagine that your kids are 18 to 25. What a great time for you to buy sets for all your kids. Okay. All information that you're extracting from a simple question of how long have you owned Cutco? Another question, how did you get introduced to Cutco? Do you even ask that question? That's not a question that I hear a lot of people ask. How did you get introduced to it? Why is that so important? Because I wanna see, I wanna see if they're used to getting good deals like buying it at Costco. 
or I want to see if they're used to buying at a retail online for, or from a new rep. So did they buy from a new rep? Did they buy it online? Did they buy it at a fair and show? In which show, right? Or did they buy it at Costco? Because again, once I have that information, if I'm working with someone that I know has bought at Costco, if you don't find that information out to the very end, you might have a lot harder time closing a deal because they've bought at Costco the last three times and they've only bought two to three to four pieces for a significant discount. So you want to gather that information a lot sooner so that you're able to utilize that and position Cutco and buying at the Texas State Fair as a reason for why this would make the most sense to buy it here today now. So one thing that I always share with my customers, and I would assume or hope that most of you guys are sharing this too, but every single event I work, I, I find a reason or a way to make that event really special. So for the Texas you know, State Fair, it's really easy. Hey, just so you know, this is the second largest producing fair in the entire country. But if I was in your guys' shoes, I would say, hey, just so you know, the Texas State Fair is the largest populated event that we at Cutco work in the entire country. Because they're not paying attention to your language as much as they're paying attention to the general idea, right? So you guys might be currently the second producing amount of Cutco at a single event, but there's more people that go to the Texas State Fair than anyone else, any other fair anywhere, right? You know, two, I just looked it up recently. It's like 2.3, 2.4 million people. So you can word it in a way that's like, hey, this is the largest populated event that Cutco attends in the entire country. And because of that, we like to offer special discounts here that you can't always get everywhere else. And so if you were ever going to buy Cutco, right now today would be one of the best times and places to do it, right? That's like a good, powerful intro into you know, educating someone who hasn't heard of Cutco or even if they own Cutco about that event. But what's interesting is you can utilize that same verbiage in a different way, right? So Kelly and Seth Field trained at the Upland Lemon Festival, right? That's five miles, 10 miles from uh, the LA County Fair, but it's only a three day event. So all I say is, hey, just so you know, Brian, this is the largest producing three-day event we have in the entire Inland Empire for Cutco. So you can say it's a two-day event. You can say it's a three-day event. You can say it's a four-day event. You can say it's a specific city. You can say it's a specific county, right? You can say in a division, right? You can word it in a way so the customer feels really special to be there, right? Perceived perception of value of why this is a special time and place to buy it. Why is that intro and that phrasing so important? Well, most importantly, it creates urgency and it sets the tone. It sets the tone for the rest of the conversation that you're gonna have with that customer. And it handles a lot of objections if you do it the right way. It handles the question of, well, can I buy online? Well, you can, but from what we already spoke about, it would make more sense to buy it here, right? Can I think about it? Why do you need to think about it? This is the best event, best time, best place to buy Cutco, right? It handles the objection, is this the best deal I can get? Which I'm gonna, actually this might be a good time to touch on it a little bit. Um, or, and it handles the objection of like, I've seen them at Costco, right? All those things they can say before or after, but they're not gonna carry as much like negative momentum in the dialogue you're having with your customer if you set that framework. And a lot of those objections won't even come up if that's one of the first things you say, hey, this is one of the largest events. And because of that, we like to offer special discounts here that you can't always get everywhere else. I'm never saying it's the best deal on the face of the planet. I'm not saying they can't get that deal anywhere else. I'm just saying it's one of the best places to get it. Why? Because they get me. They get the interaction, they get the rapport, they get the connection, they get me as their loyal Cutco guy that's gonna take care of them 
for the rest of eternity, right? And so that has way more leverage than if they can save a couple dollars somewhere else. The last, this will be the second, maybe the third year that we're doing retail pricing at the LA County Fair. And this is a very similar language pattern that I've taught people on our team, which is it's, you know, you go into an electronic store to buy a TV, but maybe you're not sure if you want to buy it or not. And, but you know, you, you're in the market for it, let's say, and maybe going into the store, you want to do your research going into the store. You plan on looking at two or three other locations or of, of the exact same TV to make sure you're getting the best price. But we've all had that time where you go into the first one and it doesn't have to be a TV, it could be anything. And you just have a really powerful experience with a really great sales rep. You have that great experience with that great sales rep and there's so much rapport and connection built that you forget, or even if you don't forget, your idea of wanting to do more research, your idea of wanting to go to another store dissipates, right? Loses momentum because of the great experience you have. And because of that connection you have with that person, you don't really even think to care if you are getting the best deal because of the experience you're having. It happens all the time, right? But you have to create that. You have to be responsible for that, right? And if you're uncomfortable with it, that's just a limiting belief. That's just scarcity that's, and fear and doubt that's entering into your mind. And there's people on your team currently that can do it really well and look at it as an opportunity for growth. Look at it as an opportunity for you to build a lot of front end value and more self-worth and value for yourself as their Cutco person. Right. I, it, it's a very rare situation where I'm giving them much more than 10% off. Very rare. Right. If they're a new customer, you know, even more rare. If they're a past customer, you know, it's like five to 10% off. Like I try to do my best to stay in that range. Now there's always exceptions to the rule. Sometimes, you know, you need to give them something else, but I have trained my language and my process of taking them through this that's like hey this is the best price when they say can you do any better and they're looking at a homemaker for 1273 I say no that is the lowest price you're gonna buy Cutco whether it's here or even online so if you're if this is the lowest price you're gonna get it right you either can afford it or you can't I can show you a smaller package and I literally tell my customers if you wanted the price five dollars less I can't do that now could I of course I could, but I refuse to lower the value of Cutco. I'll tell you right this, this right now, you guys, if I could charge the home, every single set we sell pieced out and not have the fear of knowing that there's other doing that, which is everybody, no one does it at that price. But if I could get everyone on board in the country to sell Cutco pieced out, I am 110% on board. 110%. I wish Cutco would have like a 20% increase because I fully believe I could sell it at that price. And I fully believe that it's worth that and another two, three X. Right. And you hear it in my tonality. You hear it in my voice, how much I believe that. So when I'm speaking to my customers, I speak to them in the same way. Right. You can't worry about the 2% of people who are going to go online. If that, right? I'm focusing on building value, building connection with my customers. So that's my little snippet about you guys doing retail. And I, I joked with Kelly, I was like, because I was encouraging her to influence you guys to switch over to retail. And like me doing this is probably shooting myself in the foot to allowing you guys to sell more than us at the LA County Fair. But like, it's the easiest way to increase profit margins and to sell more Cutco. I think as a team, our average order was like $500, right? Why? Because our showstoppers were retail, right? $500 as a collective team, 550, right? That's huge. So there you go, right? You guys, just so you guys know, you should be doing 50% more than the LA County Fair. I encourage you guys to figure out a way to do that because your, your event's three days long, four, five days longer. 
and you have a million people more than us. You literally have almost twice as many people as us and more days, right? So any limiting beliefs you have of like trying to chase the LA County Fair, take that out and ask yourself, how do we crush the LA County Fair? Because there shouldn't be a competition between Texas and LA on who can sell more. You guys should be selling more, way more, with the amount of people that you guys have at that event. Okay, so just something to like, just a little mental shift to have as you guys are doing these meetings and thinking about it for this year and years to come. All right, back to topic. Um, <clears throat> so we all asked the question, we have two packages, right? We have the five piece package and we have an upgrade package, right? You guys, most of you say that. Um, so what I say is, hey, we have two packages, Mrs. Jones, we have our five piece package. And then we also have our upgrade program, which is what most of our past customers end up doing. So I say that at the end, what most of our customers end up doing. I'm using social proof and I'm verbally telling my customers, hey, this is what most people do. So these are our two options, but this is what most people do, right? I'm urging them, I'm guiding them, I'm bumping them to the idea of doing an upgrade package. Now, one thing to keep in mind, right, is when you're offering these two package, packages, you, you want to get a read for what they are comfortable with. What are they comfortable with? You know, just because they say the five piece, 110% doesn't mean you can't bump them up to an upgrade, right? Just because they say an up, just because they say a five piece doesn't mean you can't sell them an upgrade. All that means is that's just where they're comfortable starting, right? Way different mindset shift, right? But how many times when they say a five piece, do you ever try to actually sell an upgrade? How many times? Is it every single time? Because I'm willing to bet it's not, right? And that's the difference. So being able to identify like, cool, they said a five piece, I'm gonna get them sold on a five piece, then I'm gonna show them why an upgrade makes more sense. And then I can bring back in what I told them earlier, which is like, hey, this is what most people do anyways, it's the most value, the most bang for your buck, and especially if you're gonna do it eventually, it'd probably make more sense to do it now. Let me give you a reason why. And that can be your goal, that can be that you're trying to beat someone next to you, that can be anything under the sun. All right, here's another question. Do you remember how much your set is when you bought it? Do you ever ask that question? You should every single time, right? Why, why are we doing this? What's the purpose behind it? Well, most importantly, I want to condition them for a higher price. So I don't care what they say. I don't care if it's accurate or not. I want them to tell me a price, right? And I'll tell them, cool, you paid $1,000 10 years for that set. Or well, keep in mind, that was 10 years ago. You can imagine what that set costs today, right? With inflation, the price of metal, et cetera, et cetera, right? I'm conditioning them for a higher price before I've even shown them the price. Most importantly, the number one reason why I ask this question, when do I ask it? If you're, if you're wondering, you should, know, you should be wondering because it's really important when you ask it. You ask it before you show prices, before you show an upgrade, before you show the set, whatever you're showing them, you always ask them the question, do you remember how much your set was when you bought it? Why? Because you want them to remember the pain of when they first bought their set. The pain of like, oh, I have to buy this. The pain of having to tell their husband. The pain of their wife screaming at the husband because he bought the set and you spent how much on it? You want them to remember this, whether it was last year, whether it was 10 years ago, whether it was 50 years ago, right? So you want them to remember the pain of when they first bought the set, but you also want them to remember the peace of knowing how great an investment it was. Why? Because you're going to take them through the exact same emotional process in about two minutes. So you want them to remember exactly 
what they went through, the fears they had, the concerns they had, the pain they had, because then you're going to do the exact same thing, but it's not going to feel that bad because the peace of knowing how great of an investment it was and why they bought it in the first place is going to overpower any fear of, oh, I got to pay my call at my daughter's tuition or I got plumbing to fix or whatever their BS objection is. Another question. Hey, did you get all your friends and family on board with Cutco? Or are you the only ones that have it? Why do I ask that question? Do you ask that question? You should. Two reasons why. One, it gives you really good leads. Oh no, yeah, I'm the only one. What? You gotta get all your other friends and family on board. Hey, are they going to the fair at all? Great, I have a referral card. Bring them over, blah, 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 give you a bonus, okay? How about a bigger reason is, oh, your friends have Cutco? Great, which set do they have? Oh, I think they have the big set. Oh, and you're only getting the family set? Oh, keeping up with Mrs. Jones, right? Leverage, figure out what their friends and family have because a lot of times you can leverage that, leverage that with the idea of like, well, you gotta keep up with them. We should just get you the complete set with the big steak knives. They'd be so pissed that they never got the big steak knives. How awesome would that be? You're gonna end up doing it eventually. It probably make more sense just to do it now. Would you wanna just see what that would look like for fun? Now, you show them the price, you give them the payment options, right? What do you do after that? Well, the most important thing is you wanna review, I'm gonna repeat that, you wanna review what they get after you show them the price every single time. Why? Because it's giving them a chance to fully internalize the price and internalize how it's going to fit in their budget. Right? I watch CSPs all the time and they're like, great, it's 425 a month. And then they ask the soft close questions, which are still great to ask black or white, dark or cherry. Great. You want to just pay it in full or do payments? Great questions asked. Nothing wrong with that. Right. But you're literally asking for the order within about 20 seconds, 30 seconds after you've just shown them the price and opened the booklet. What's the problem with that? Well, this is the first time they're actually seeing the price. So this is now their time to like review what they're actually getting, but you're not doing that for them. So then they give you the objection of, I need to think about it, right? And so it's your job to not allow them to think about it on their own. You want them to think about it with you there. So you walk them through the thought process they should have. So Kelly, let me go ahead and review with you what you're actually getting for that price. And I'll literally go through every single piece, connect every single item with something they've shared with me in the dialogue at some point in the last 10, 15 minutes. Right? So they're seeing like, yes, I'm going to use that check, 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 check. And now imagine how nice it'll be Seth, where you can get rid of everything else in your kitchen and have one simple set, right? Again, visually taking them through the whole process, right? Gives them time to process. You need that time. You'll get a lot less of, I need to think about it. And by the way, if you can tell they're not quite ready to say yes, don't ask for the order. Remind them of the guarantee, remind them, give them a third party story. Like you can tell through practice, right? Looking at the customer, if they're ready to say yes or no. And you wanna be very in tune with that because when you see it, that's when you put your hand out. How awkward is it when you put your hand out and they're not ready? Oh yeah, it just kills momentum, right? So you wanna be very intentional about when you do that. Now a question that I've been recently adding that's a little newer, is and after I do white or black, dark handles or dark handles or pearl, cherry finish, honey finish, I then ask the question, so is there anything else you'd want to add to your collection besides this set? Soft close, an assumption that they're already buying the set and you to identify what else they might like. Why is that so useful? Well, if it gets to the point where it's a matter of 
making the deal or not making the deal, you can throw those pieces in for free, right? They might say, yeah, I think we'll do this, but we also need, I think we need the gadgets. We need a cleaver in that family set. Cool. Let's just add that. That'll actually be less than if you just bought the whole complete set, right? And you can get the one piece that you want added on, right? So if anything, it adds more CPO to your order. It assumes the sale. And even if you don't close it right on the spot, you can then use, utilize whatever that wish list item is to close the deal. If I give you one extra little special discount for you to do it right now. So <clears throat> that is most of my time. Um, an assignment besides what I've walked you through so far, especially since you guys have a month or so before the event, is script out your pitch. Don't script out someone else's pitch. Script out what you say. Record yourself at the next event you work this weekend, right? Pay someone or do it yourself to literally word for word, like record them until you get one full pitch in, record it, type it out, read it, ask yourself, why am I asking this question? Was this, is this the right question to ask and at the right time or should I move it somewhere else, right? Take the time to really internalize this because that is what's going to allow you to have so much more clarity right? So much more intention, so much more purpose, right? Have more conviction, more belief in everything that you're saying. So if you ask yourself the why of every single sentence, I promise you the impact, the influence that you'll be able to have with every single customer interaction will, will tenfold, all right? That's what I got for you guys. Awesome. I can see everyone just silently clapping and cheering and applause everywhere. So thank you. Yeah, Seth is, you can be loud. He can hear you. Oh, hey. <laughs> hey, buddy. Yeah. Um, so guys, Brandon, you still have a few minutes for a Q&A. We have a couple yeah. questions. Mm -hmm. All right. So guys, it looks like um, I have uh, two questions over on the side here. Oh, no, Luke. Oh, yeah, Luke's got another question. Um, if you guys have any questions, add them over to the chat in the side, and that way I can ask it out loud for you. It's much easier than us trying to popcorn people with videos. So um, jot it down over in the group chat if you have questions. So uh, the first one we already have over here is Carlton said, um, what are some of the questions that you find really build connections quickly at the booth? I'm assuming like rapport type questions, right? That build connections quickly at the booth to create that amazing experience for customers. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so when it comes to, you know, and by the way, uh, normally what I'll do is if like you're asking me what questions do I ask, how I figure out what questions I ask is I'm asking myself, like, what does the customer need? Right. If I was the customer, how do I need to feel? So if I was in the customer's shoes, Carlton, I would want to have laughter right? I would want to have a common thread. I would want to sh share a similar experience. So if that means when they cut themselves, you can share an experience like, like that. If that means like, you know, a situation of like making the purchase and how it was difficult and you can say, oh yeah, that's so funny. You say that I have a lot of my customers that feel the same way, right? Any commonality, any similarity, right? And then obviously being your genuine funny self, Carlton, those are going to be the things that really like mold you bond you to that customer so it's not like one specific question it's like what it what it and I'm, I'm i'm answering the question this way carlton because it'll provide more value than just saying hey i say this exact specific line because it's different for each person it's more of like understanding the fundamental principles and concepts of how you create that connection and then reflecting on it for yourself and that's you know how you come up with a really solid answer so i hope that answers gives you some clarity awesome um luke asked instead of dropping the price are you leveraging bonus items to sweeten the deal so if you're on the package they already want and you need to sweeten the deal they're going to walk away um, instead of dropping the price are you just leveraging all those bonus items or what's your what's yes your on that? yes so um i always try to leave them with something free peeler right just something small um but if i need something extra to sweeten the deal it's going to be free stuff 
right? If you guys, I know there's a couple of mathematicians, uh, you know, on the call, Josh being one of them and running all the numbers, which is the amount of income you lose by giving something for free is a lot, lot less than something that you discount and then have to get for free on top of that, right? And so if you, you know, if you, if you care about your bottom line, which I would assume everyone does, it's always better to give something for free. So I always ask the question, hey, uh, Luke, if you really, really wanted to, could you fit 648 into the budget for the ultimate mistake nights? If you really, really wanted to, right? And if they say yes, right, there's no need to discount it, right? If they say no, and how, how do they say no, right? Because they could say no in a lot of different ways. If it's like, no, absolutely not. Like, there's just no way. Cool. Probably just, just drop down to something a lot smaller. They're like, ah, I mean, we could, but I don't know, right? You need to decipher the difference between that. And sometimes if I'm unsure, I'll ask the same question again just to get more clarity by how they respond. But if they say yes to any extent, right, I'm never dropping the price. And if I have to drop the price, I'm dropping the package. I don't drop the price of the set. Why? Because if I can drop the price of the package, build value on that, which is probably a whole nother conversation, but let's say you do that, right? Ultimate to family. They say yes to that. There's nothing to say that you can't get them back up to the ultimate at a little extra discount, but right? you already have the credit card, right? That's the difference. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense, Brandon. I'm just really curious real quick. Uh, so are you asking that uh, if they can budget question before you ask? It sounded like you're asking that question before you ask for the order. Is that what you're No, no this is after they're like, this is after they've, they're giving me an objection. So if they're giving me some form of an objection, I'm trying to get clarity on where are we having a hiccup for them to say yes. Like where's the holdup? And so, you know, is it the price? I'm, I'm trying to identify, is the price where there's a holdup? And they're like, no, we could afford it. Or yeah, we could make it work if we wanted to, then it's something else. That and that's sense. when you're not, that's when you're building value, reminding guarantee, et cetera, and maybe offering a bonus item. Or I'm, you're saying. I'm asking that question um, after I've asked for the order and if they're not saying yes, and if they're saying something else like, Oh, I don't know, Brandon, we need to think about it. So I'm asking from there, I'm going to start asking questions to gain clarity for why they need to think about it. Right. Do they need to think about it? Cause they don't know if they're going to use all the pieces. Are they going to think about it? Cause they're not sure if it can fit into the budget. Why do they need to think about it? Um, and so normally one of the biggest places that customers get hooked up on is if they can or cannot afford it. So I just very directly ask them, Hey, if you really wanted to, could you fit that into the budget? It's either yes or no. If it's not, let's move on to something smaller because I'm wasting my time and your time. Lots of reps don't ask that question or they don't, they're not bold enough to ask the question. So you're trying to, you know, lower the price where if you were to ask that question, they may have said, no, we could afford it. So now you're not even building value in the way you need to for. So you need to identify what the issue is. Cool, thank you. Awesome, um, question from Marissa. She said, what is the best way to frame the full price five piece? Um, which is a great question. That was something I struggled with a little bit at this last fair. You know, you can say, oh, it's $15 worth of stuff. Cutco packages it for twelve seventy three dollars at a discount. But with five pieces, like how exactly do you kind of position that and frame it, even though it's just full price? How do so you get like great, the urgency of it? Yeah, great question. So <clears throat> the, the thing about the five piece is you don't even need to put like retail and then Texas State Fair discount or special price. Just put the price because most of the time you're dropping from a galley or a homemaker down to a five piece to lock them in. Right? So when you're dropping that much in price, they don't need to see the discrepancy in 
what it should cost to what it is here. They just want to see why well, I was looking at $1,300. Now I'm looking at 500 or 470, right? I'm looking at one third almost of the price or about one third, right? So, and really the perception is going to be the block, right? Taking out the block helps a lot. And you just build value around like, hey, these are the pieces that you aren't getting, but it sounds like you weren't gonna use those anyways. Like how often do you cut open like, or carve a turkey once a year, great. How often do you cut up like a whole chicken or cut through bone, not very often, great. So you're losing pieces you're not gonna use anyways, Mrs. Jones, so you get the five piece, Marissa, that you're probably gonna use all the time. And the great thing about this is by you getting this today, it locks you into promotions that you can get in the future. Right, so just give them reasons why this makes more sense. So it's so step away, Marissa, from the idea of like having to frame it in a certain way and put more focus on why this package makes sense based on the conversation you guys have had thus far. Awesome, um, Stephen. We did see your question. You wanted the exact phrasing, and then. Um... Josh actually answered it for you there in the chat. So I think we've got that taken care of, I believe. Um, so Roger asked, he said, when you ask them, ooh, which pieces do you own? Like when they're walking away um, and you point to the knife. So after the fact, they come over and they show you. Um, when they're with a group of people, how do you keep them around? Like after you ask that question, what's kind of your next intro to keeping them engaged and keeping them sticking around when they're just trying to kind of walk away and you ask them which piece they, they have already? What's your favorite piece, right? always get them excited, strike a chord, because whatever their favorite piece is, they're gonna be super proud of. Oh, the chef knife, or oh, that spatula, that's so great, you can use, or the cheese knife, whatever. So you're, you're leveraging something that you know they're genuinely gonna be excited about to retain them in the, in the setting, right? And then from there, you can say, oh my gosh, if that's your favorite piece, you're gonna absolutely love this new one we just came out with. And now you're guaranteed to show them something that they don't have versus, oh, do you have the cheese knife? Oh yeah, bought it five years ago because it's not a new piece anymore, right? So you're using data, right, to filter out stuff that's not gonna have the same impact and to be able to show them something that they don't have that's gonna provide more value. And by the way, there is something else I think I forgot in my message that Roger, that just reminded me of. Um, Oh, the question of, have you ever considered adding to your collection, right? Great question to ask, but you guys, I, I find that a lot of CSPs ask it way too soon, right? Don't ask the question right at the beginning. It's very easy for a lazy rep to ask it. It's very easy to ask to, for any rep to ask after a 12 hour day. It's the last hour on a Sunday, you've worked 40 hours in the last three days and you're dead tired and you don't wanna go through the process. So what's the cheap question to ask? Have you ever thought about adding to your collection? Because if they say no, that means I don't have to spend any time with them. But you're asking that question holds no water, like holds no weight when you, when you think about it because unless they were looking to add to their collection, which they probably weren't, they're gonna tell you no. If they've had the same set for 20 years, why would they ever think about adding to their collection? Right, so you're losing so many customers by asking that, so by asking that in the beginning. So when do you ask it? You ask it after you get them excited about a couple pieces. Because once you've shown them a couple pieces, right, and they're like super genuinely thrilled about, wow, that's a great piece, you know, that I, you can, they can see how that's going to complement what they already have. But now when you ask the question, it's going to deliver more of an impact because they now have other knives that they're looking at in front of you that they're really excited about. Hey, Brandon. What's up, Seth? I remember when we were out there uh, training, you had positioned in with the, uh, your five piece, a peeler and a cutting board mm -hmm. to create, create a little bit of like perceived value. You'd bonus like a medium cutting board and a peeler. Are you not doing that anymore? No, you can do that too. So basically I'll show them a picture of everything that comes in it. And then you don't have to have the picture of the peeler and the cutting board on there. Um, and then, so that can be perceived value. So it's like, Hey, this is what you get for this price. 
by the way, because of how big this event is, we also include a $45 peeler, right? Include, not for free, include a $45 peeler and you know a $35 cutting board with it or whatever size cutting board you want. Um, so it's not on there, but it's like that extra icing on the cake that they weren't expecting after you've shown them the whole set. Awesome. Okay, Brian, we are ready for your question. I see that you pop back up here again. Uh, honestly, he he kind of hit uh, he kind of hit what I was going to ask about, but uh, I will throw one other thing out. You know, for us uh, going to full prices, you know, a lot of the questions have obviously been kind of in that that vein. Um, I think we're so used to as a part of our scripts, like a lot of our value building stuff just has to do with like, oh, it's the best place to shop because we save our customers anywhere from 10 to da da da. And I, I know you talked about really leveraging the event um, itself, why it's so big, why it's so special. But I guess what are some of the early interest phrasing you do or, or even just conceptually like, um, you know, ways that you sort of engage or create that with the customer? I'm assuming it's just through your own series of quality questions, but any, any other thoughts or elaboration you have on that? Just kind of, I guess, building value and shopping with us here. Yeah. Um, I think what a lot of it, what it comes down to is not necessarily putting your faith and trust and telling them that, hey, this is the best, lowest price. Because like just to play devil's advocate, when you guys were doing that last year, was it genuinely the best place you could buy Cutco? Could they have gotten a homemaker for less than a catalog? Could they have gone to the Iowa, Iowa State Fair, you know, the month prior, the two months prior and bought it from Mike Dowd for less because he gives like crazy deals? Yeah, technically, <laughs> right? So it's not, right? So if anything, like you're actually speaking with more integrity by doing it this way and it's almost the same thing, but you're just now profiting more because of it. Um, and so... I think it's more of like, what are, it's not the words that you're saying, but it's like your tonality and the energy that you bring. And um, so for me, like if I was working, well, I don't have to pretend I was working, like if I was working at LA County Fair, Texas State Fair, like when you're working that event, um, the, the main thing I just promote is like how it's the largest event in the country, right? And so it's a great place to buy Cutco. So if you were ever going to buy anything, this would be the time to do it, right? Tell me a little bit about what you have at home, right? And then, I'm, and then I just transition into like what they have and I show them, you know, what, what they're missing. Again, like the whole like going to its uh, Best Buy or somewhere to buy a TV, it's like you kind of forget that you wanted to shop at two other places because of the experience that you're having because of how much value you're building right? You show them an upgrade to a signature and they're like, well, this piece isn't going to fit my Santoku trimmer that I got at Costco. I'm like, oh, that's a great point, Brian. Got a little tr trick for you. This is something I learned from all my experience. You can actually double it up, right? Small things like that, that just add a lot of value to the customer. They're like, wow, this is an experience that I'm having. Unlike any experience I've ever had at Costco online, a demo at another state fair, so a great question that I would pose to everybody on the team is how can you create, create an exceptional customer experience that is unparalleled to any other fair in the entire country? Because that is what's going to provide the value and the leverage to be able to have, to, for you to have that extra la layer of confidence and not have to worry about them going and looking somewhere else. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brandon. I want to see another round of high fives from everyone. Celebration. Bringing Thanks, the guys. fire to Safer of Texas, giving us the goods to beat the LA County Fair. Hey, Love all it. I ask is that if you guys yeah. beat, beat us, I get a shout out. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so many shout outs. We owe it all to you, Brandon. <laughs> all right, Thank you so much. We appreciate it. I'll turn it back over to Josh now. All right, guys. So, Brandon, first off, thank you. Uh, I will just acknowledge in front of the group, I think that is hands down the best uh, message I've ever seen you deliver um, and facilitate. Uh, and I really appreciate you just putting in the preparation, putting in the time, and then bringing the goods and the energy to the day's call. I, I speak for everybody when I can say we can feel your energy and we can feel your commitment to really serving. And that means a lot to us as a team. We don't, uh, we don't take that for granted. And I do believe we have the best team in the nation. They're the most open to growth and hearing from other people. And they're, they're even more open and committed to taking what they're learning and actually following through on executing it. Because I've seen that happen time and time again for years.